Hello, everybody, and welcome to Après Midi with Jake Lamar, who I would like to introduce. Would you please stand up, Jake? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, Jake, you're going to be presenting Viper's Dream. Is that oh, well, right? Bobby's talking about my ah. body of work, but this is mostly about Viper's Dream, yes. Yeah, th yes, this is definitely a body of work. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, you could fill a lot of bodies with it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just a little bit about Jake. He grew up in, Bro in the Bronx, New York. After graduating from Harvard University, he spent six years writing for Time magazine. He's lived in Paris since 1993, one year before me, and teaches creative writing at one of France's top universities, Sciences Po. He's the author of a memoir, seven novels, numerous essays, reviews, and short stories, and a play. His most recent work, Viper's Dream, is both a crime novel and an audio drama set in the jazz world of Harlem between 1936 and 1961. He's a recipient of the Lindhurst Prize for his first book. Where's that? Bourgeois Blues. Is that you on the cover? I'll show that around. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll pass that around later. Ah, that, 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 that. that was me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We all have those photos. <laughs> uh, a prestigious center, Centre National du Livre Grant for his novel Posterité. Do you I have don't have that you? one with me. You know no. that one with you? Mm -mm, no. Shame on you. Okay, France's grand prize for best foreign thriller for his novel, The Last Integrationist. That's Nous That's avions un rêve that in French. That one. Uh. Uh -huh. And a Beaumarchais fellowship for his play, Brothers in Exile. He is currently working on a memoir about his life in Paris. Wow. <laughs> on that note, Thank you, Jake Lamar. Thank the, you, Adrian. The uh, stage is yours. Thank you, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to thank Adrian for the invitation. I, I've, I've known Adrian for years, but only recently discovered that she's a reality TV star. <laughs> this, was, this, was, this was news to me. Um, and thanks for turning out. I did not expect this many people on a rainy Tuesday afternoon. So, uh, so thank you very much. Um, great to see you all here. So I'm going to just talk about, you know, how I got to this point in life. Uh, I'll talk for 45 minutes or so and open the floor to questions. But feel free to jump in at any time if, uh, if, you, if you have a, a question or a comment before uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm done talking about my life so far. So let me start with uh, a question that I often get in one form or another, which is, how does one become a writer? How does it happen? And my answer is every writer starts out as a reader. I, I think all of us who go into this crazy vocation from a young age, we just loved that rapport you have with a book. You, 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 you love the way a writer can get you to feel and think differently. And you get to a point in your life where you want to be on the other side of that process. You want to be the person getting people to feel and think differently. So I was a voracious reader from the time I learned how. When I was very young, I loved uh, Agatha Christie and Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, mystery stories. And then um, around the time I was 12, going on 13, in the space of just a few months, I read four works that really changed the course of my life. And they were The Bluest Eye, Toni Morrison's first novel, um, a Raisin in the Sun, a play by Lorraine Hansberry, Black Boy, Richard Wright's memoir of growing up um, in the South at the beginning of the 20th century, and Go Tell It on the Mountain, James Baldwin's first novel. Um, and I often have to explain to younger audiences, this is, I'm talking about the early 1970s, I don't remember ever seeing black characters in children's books. What blew me away about those four works was that it was the first time I saw people like myself, my family, our friends, that is to say, ordinary African Americans in literature. And once I realized that was possible, <laughs> it opened up a whole new way of thinking for me. So uh, Baldwin's book is probably no, a very autobiographical first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, about it kid growing up in a difficult family in Harlem. I was growing up in a difficult family in the Bronx. <clears throat> I was so moved by this book and I asked my teacher, um, who is James Baldwin? And the first thing I remember him saying was, 
he lives in Paris, which seemed like such an exotic <laughs> idea to me that, that somebody with that background would live in Paris. So um, around the same time that I was getting the idea, well, maybe someday I might like to be a writer, I thought, well, maybe someday I might like to live in Paris. It must have been a few weeks later that I read Black Boy by Richard Wright, which is very much about his, his childhood in the South, and then he eventually went to the North. Both my parents were from the South, my, my mother from Louisiana, my father from Georgia. They were part of the great migration from the, of African Americans from the, from the rural South to the urban North in the 20th century. So that book really spoke to me. And then I found out Richard Wright had lived in Paris. So, so this was starting to seem like a pattern. Only later did I discover Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Henry Miller, the whole crew. But from my earliest inklings of wanting to be a, wanting to be a, a writer, I also connected writing to Paris somehow. Um, it would be another 20 years before I would get the chance. Um, as the little bio says. Um, so I, I grew up in the Bronx. I lived uh, down the street from Yankee Stadium. Uh, my family were sort of were clinging to you know, the middle class you know, by our fingernails. Um, I went on half scholarship to a very progressive school called uh, Fieldston, which is where I was assigned all those wonderful books. Um, then um, uh, went to Harvard. Um, knew in my heart that I wanted to be a writer, but tried to talk myself out of it. For, for four years. But at the same time, when I was thinking, oh, I should go to law school, do something safe, the whole time I was working on my writing. So I took creative writing classes, four out of eight semesters. I wrote movie reviews for uh, the Harvard Crimson, the Daily Paper. Um, I was in a major, history and literature, where I was cranking out papers all the time. So I was working on my writing all the time. Finally, Luckily, thanks to a professor of mine, my thesis advisor, uh, a man named Robert Coles, um, he recommended me for a job uh, at Time Magazine. He knew uh, uh, one of the top writers at Time Magazine. I went in, interviewed, and they gave me a shot. Um, so um, two weeks after I graduated from college, I started writing for, for Time Magazine. I'm talking about June of 1983 now. Um, back then, Time had this system, I don't know if they still have it, but there was a system developed by Henry Luce back in the 1920s where you had writers in New York and reporters all over the world. So most of the six years I was at Time Magazine, I wrote for uh, the Nation section. So I was writing on all things concerning the United States. Eventually I was writing mostly about politics. Um, but I rarely left my desk in New York. I, I, I would get a reportage from uh, Central America, the Middle East, uh, Washington, D.C. It was my job to pull all that together and, and dress it up in the famous Time style. Um, and uh, I actually, you know, line for line, I, I, I enjoyed the job. It was, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a fun kind of word game of playing, working for Time magazine. Um, but you know, it was the 1980s, it was the Reagan era. Uh, Time was a pretty conservative magazine. My politics have always been very much to the left. Um, there were 60 writers um, on the staff during the years I was there. And how many were African -American? There were never, in the six years I was there, there were never more than three black writers at any one given time. A lot of the time I was the only black writer on the staff. So uh, it was a very white male environment. But I did well there, you know, I wrote cover stories, um, I, I did well in the job. But I knew I didn't want to spend my life at Time Magazine. I wanted to write books, I wanted to write my own stuff. So this is advice I give to people who are interested in writing. If you want to try it out, find a time in your week. Maybe it's one night, the two hours before you go to bed, or one morning, the first two hours you wake up. Maybe it's Saturday afternoons, but find a time, find a créneau, as the French say, in your week, two, three, four hours, where you're alone and you're just trying to get what's in your head on the page or the screen. You're not answering your phone, you're not checking your email, you're not updating your social media. You're just trying to get what's in your head on the page or the screen. Two, three, four hours. Do that once a week for a year and see how you feel.
you might find you don't like writing. It's, it's absolutely solitary. It can be very tedious if you're trying to do it well. Or you might find that you're, you're sitting with some good material. And this was the case for me when I decided to get serious about my own writing. My work week at Time Magazine was um, Tuesday to Saturday. And you know, I decided, okay, Sunday I'm gonna rest. And Monday, I'm just gonna lock myself in my apartment in Manhattan and I'm going to write. I'm gonna write whatever comes into my head. Um, so I started doing this, spending Monday afternoon, Monday evening, not answering the phone, just writing. And I found after some months, what I was writing about was largely about my father. So um, my father, we, we were estranged at the time. Uh, my father grew up poor in Georgia, was a brilliant student, um, got a scholarship to go to college. I'm talking about the late 1940s now. So you know, the hardcore days of segregation, he didn't have much choice in where he could go to college, but he was very proud to go to Morehouse College, a historically black school. Uh, he was there the same time as Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, they didn't know each other, but my father knew who he was. Um, after college, he was drafted, served in Korea, um, and after the war, moved to New York, went to NYU. NYU, I think he got his degree in business administration at NYU. Met my mother, who was the sister of one of his army buddies. They got married and started a family. Um, I'm the second of three kids. And, uh, and my, my father did well for himself, uh, mainly as an accountant and, uh, and a business consultant. Um, but my father had this grandiose dream of being a billionaire. He had that, that crazy American dream. He, he wanted to make it in the construction business. And, and, and years ago, when I would talk to French audiences I, and try to give them a sense of my father's ambition, before the French knew who this person was, I would say, my, my dad wanted to be someone a bit like Donald Trump, you know? I, I don't say that so much anymore. Um, but it's true, he, he wanted to build skyscrapers with his name on them. He had this really grandiose American dream. Um, but he got involved in the construction business in New York, which is a very, you know, corrupt business. Um, he got mixed up with some very shady people. And uh, the week I was graduating from college, he called me to say um, he wasn't coming to my graduation and he had lost everything. And uh, my parents were divorced at the time and I was very angry with him for the way he treated my mother. So I was like, fine, whatever. I already had the job at Time Magazine lined up. So I moved to Greenwich Village with two friends from college and started my grown up life. And three, four years later, I found myself writing about my father all the time because he was just such a fascinating person. Oh, I should say that in that two week period between the time I graduated and the time I started at Time Magazine, I went to my father's apartment in the Bronx and he was just gone. I mean, his clothes, papers, you know, the furniture was still there, but otherwise he was just gone. And I didn't know where he was, but told myself I didn't care. And then I found myself writing about him because he was just such a turbulent personality. Um, and while I'm writing these pages about my dad, one morning I got a call from a private investigator. They were tracking down people who'd been involved in these shady deals. Um, he was looking for my father. Um, we have the same name. I'm a junior. So, um, so anyway, I, I hung up on the private investigator, but I thought I should maybe find out where my father is anyway. And, and he wasn't far. He was in Yonkers, you know, which is just <laughs> north of the Bronx. But, uh, but I located him, uh, mainly through my brother, who had, made, had some sort of tenuous contact still. Um, and I saw him for one last time, and, and it was just... It was just impossible to get along with him. I mean, he was really, he was just a bully. And, and, and he really couldn't accept me as a grown man. I, I was 27 the last time I saw him. And I walked out of that meeting and I thought, God, this guy, he's impossible. But he's, he's so fascinating. He's like a character in a book. And I thought, somebody ought to write a book about this man. <laughs> and, and I realized I was the only person in the position to do it. So, um, so I wrote a book contract, um, you know, inspired by those pages I've been racking up in those Monday afternoons. Found an agent back in those days, I'm talking about 1988 now, it was impossible to get published in America without an agent. But because I worked at Time Magazine, it was easy for me to find an agent. She's still my agent since 1988. Wow. Um, and, um, and 
I wrote a book proposal, got a contract with an imprint of Simon & Schuster that no longer exists. Um, as soon as I got the contract, quit my job at Time Magazine and embarked on this crazy life as an independent writer. So at the time, now I'm talking about 1989, I just turned 28. Um, it took me a while to write that first book. It was finally published in 1991. So I've got books to pass around. I don't have a PowerPoint. That never works for me. So I have books you can pass around and hold in your hand and pass them back to me. This was my first book. It's called Bourgeois Blues. That was me, as I said uh, to, uh, earlier. Um, the title comes from a Lead Belly song. The blues singer Lead Belly has a song called Bourgeois Blues. It's about Lead Belly and his wife trying to find a place to live in Washington, D.C. And they're turned down everywhere because they're black. And he says, there's a bourgeois town. I got the bourgeois blues. And, and I thought it was a very apt title for my father's life. My father struggled so hard to break into the bourgeoisie, but still found all these obstacles in his path. Um, so this came out in 1991. I, I showed this to a French friend of mine a few years ago. He said, oh, you look like that guy on Miami Vice. You know, and it's true with the, 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 the 80s shoulder pads, you know. But, uh, but it came out, uh, got some nice reviews, wasn't a big bestseller. Um, but some months after it was published, I got a call out of the blue and was told that I had won something called the Lindhurst Prize. This was thanks to that same professor, Robert Coles, who had nominated me in secret for this prize that you can't apply for. It's one of these great American things. You're nominated in secret and somebody just calls you up and tells you that you won. And um, it was a three-year grant. Um, it was enough money to live on for three years. I wow. got a check in 92, a check in 93, and a check in 94. And for me, this was like winning the lottery. And I thought, oh, here's my chance. It's a writer's dream. Well, yeah. Well, I thought, yeah. I'm going to go to Paris. And my dream was like, <laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> broke up with my girlfriend. And, you know, uh, you know uh, maybe I'll go. Uh, here's my chance. I'm going to go to Paris. So, so I arrived in Paris in September of 1993. I knew one person in France. Um, there's a friend from college who uh, uh, was doing his graduate studies here an apartment in Vincennes and a big space with a spare room. His girlfriend, now wife, mother of their kids, um, uh, she had gone back to the States, so he needed someone to share this flat in Vincennes with. So I moved to Vincennes. We were just two metro stops outside of Paris, uh, saint Mandé on the number one line. Um, and um, as I said, I didn't speak a word of French, didn't know anyone but David. But one night I saw that there was a poet named Ted Jones who was giving a reading. Ted Jones, that's J-O-A-N-S. Did you know him? No, you I didn't, didn't know, you know him, but I know of him. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he, Joe, Ted Jones was a real figure here. He was a black beat generation poet. And I had read him in high school. I'd read him back at Fieldston. And I saw he was giving a reading at a bookstore that doesn't exist anymore. Some of you might remember Tea and Tattered Pages. Oh, sure. Uh, 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 Ted was reading at Tea and Tattered Pages. So I went to the reading, and um, it, was, it was an amazing night. I mean, uh, I, I met the artist Carrie Mae Weems was there. She, she, uh, she was studying at the Cité des Arts. Uh, so I met Carrie Mae that night. We became friends. And uh, Ted had this just amazing style of reading, you know. Uh, you know, I said, Ted, Ted read his poetry the way uh, Dizzy Gillespie played the trumpet. You know? <laughs> he had this wild bebop style of reading. Uh, so I went up to him afterward and I said, um, I introduced myself, so I love your work. And he said, um, oh, you should come to my cafe. And back in the day, uh, when Ted was in Paris, because Ted was a world traveler, Ted was just, you know, a globe-trotting, vagabond genius, you know, poet, musician, painter. Um, but when he was in Paris, he had his favorite cafe on the Boulevard Saint-Germain, the Cafe Le Rouquet. It's down the street from the Cafe Floor. He used to call it the poor man's Cafe Floor. Uh, still there, same decor from the 1950s. And when Ted was in Paris, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, from four to six o'clock, he would be sitting at his favorite table on the terrace, and he would just kind of hold court. And, you know, in the winter, you might have five or six people show up at Ted's Cafe. 
in the summer, there'd be like 20 people showing up. Ted was just one of these people. He was just this magnet for interesting people. He would travel the world, meet people, say, oh, if you're ever in Paris, come see me. I think Ted was actually in a guidebook. You know, it was like, you know, go see the Eiffel Tower and visit Ted Jones at his cafe. <laughs> so in the summer, you'd have 20 people showing up at the cafe. But, you know, going back to my earliest days here in October, November of 93, you know, I'd go, I'd meet somebody at Ted's Cafe, they'd invite me over to dinner, I'd go to the dinner, meet somebody there, and so I had a social life up and running from my earliest weeks here. And they were such interesting people. I mean, just people from all over the world, you know, uh, um, usually creative, you know, uh, artists, writers, musicians. Um, and I was having a ball. So, so after that first year, I thought, let me stay a second year. And, uh, and that was when I moved <laughs> to the 18th arrondissement. Someone else was looking for a colocotaire. Um, and so I moved into an apartment that I shared on the Rue des Martyrs um, between Boulevard Rochechouart and Rue des Abbes. That's really uh, high up on Martyr in the 18th, not in the 9th. Um, and it was still, it was still, you know, the early 1990s, it was still kind of dodgy, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 that area. Um, but I, I loved it. I just fell in love with Montmartre. And um, after the second year, that sublet was, was ending. I thought, well, let me stay a third year. And so I, I found a studio apartment on the Rue de Montseny. Rue de Montseny, which starts at Place du Tertre and then descends the north side of the Butte Montmartre. <clears throat> I found a studio apartment there. Um, thought, okay, I'll stay one more year. And then at the end of the third year, met uh, La Femme de Ma Vie, and uh, I stayed. And we're still together. It's 28 years. So, <laughs> so it, 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 it worked out. <laughs> um, so that's when I committed to Paris. Um, by then, I had started um, publishing uh, novels. So my second book was my first novel. That came out in 1996. And I continued to publish several novels um, in, in, the, in, the in the 90s and into the 2000s, but only in America. Uh, finally, in 2003, I started getting published in French. And that was when my life took a real turn um, because uh, I spoke French by then, um, but I discovered French reading culture, which is just very different from what we have in America. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in this country, somewhere, every weekend, there's a book festival going on. Mm -hmm. And people turn out. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I'll talk more about what I write, but I go back and forth, in and out of the crime genre. Mm -hmm. I call a lot of my books thriller-ish. Um, and so I would get invited to crime festivals and to straight fiction festivals and got to know it's a wonderful little universe of colleagues here. And, um, and when I talk about the difference between French and American attitudes towards writing, I give as an example. Um, when I meet a French person for the first time and I tell them I'm a writer, their first question is, what do you write? When I meet an American for the first time and I tell them I'm a writer, their first question is, would I have heard of you? <laughs> and it's very revealing because the French person's interested in writing. The American's interested in, are you a famous writer? You know, are you a rich, best-selling author? And, and, I, and, I, and I think that for a lot of Americans, writing has no intrinsic value. You know, it, it's, it's what are you going to get from your writing? And, and if you're not, you know, rich or famous, people wonder why you do it. Um, and really, I think all of us do it from love. I mean, that's like the only reasonable uh, 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 motivation. But I found it's been great to live, to spend my writing life in a culture that, that where what I do is just respected on the most fundamental level. Um, I also found, once I started getting published and meeting people, that the French are just interested in what writers think about things. And so another turning point for me came in early 2008 when Barack Obama won the Iowa caucus. And uh, the whole world was like, what is this? <laughs> What's going on? Um, and so I was you know, invited to come on television and radio and talk about the phenomenon that was Barack Obama. And so I opened up a a sideline in political punditry all through that first campaign and through the Obama presidency. I was a frequent presence on French television, on French radio, talking about the Obama administration. 
And, you know, on election night, I'd be one of those guys standing in front of the map, you know, <laughs> say, if he wins Virginia, it's all over, you know. And, <laughs> and I did this for years and, 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 and really enjoyed it right up until election morning 2016 <laughs> when the results came in and I thought, I can't do this anymore. So, so I, I, I ended my career as a pundit uh, immediately. I, I, I continue to be invited for, for you know, to talk about Trump, uh, uh, Obama's successor, but I, I, I always said Ob no. <laughs> so Obama's successor, I like that. Obama's successor. So, I, so, I, so I've never gone back to, to punditry. But that led to other things. And so I was invited to become a consultant, at a literary consultant at a theater in, um, in the Banlieue. So I don't know how many folks live here all year round. But you know, um, in France, what we call the inner city in America is an outer city in France. And so you have these jewel cities. You have Paris, Lyon, Bordeaux, and the poor people, the immigrants, uh, the, the proletariat, they live in these communities that ring the cities. Um, and so um, in, Fran in Paris, you know, a lot of uh, going back to the 19th century, immigrants, factory workers, people who would come to, 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 to try and seek a better life, were immediately ghettoized, uh, usually in the north of, 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 of Paris, in, a, in the area called Seine-Saint-Denis. Um, and this was done by design. I mean, Paris's city planners did not want Paris to look like London, you know, during the Industrial Revolution. You know, you had factories, you know, appearing in the center of London. Paris didn't want that, so they put the, in the industry outside of Paris. So people who came to work in the factories were immediately sent there. Um, today, the industries are gone, but the people are still there. You know, the immigrants, children of immigrants, people trying to, 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 to get by, live in what's known as the banlieue, the suburbs, which are really just these you know, concrete communities of, of you know, uh, what we call the projects in, in America, uh, which is known with what they call cité here in, in France. But there is um, in Bobigny, one of the towns in, uh, in, uh, in Saint-Saint-Denis, uh, the French government opened a theater, uh, uh, the, the MC 93, the, uh, the, the Maison de la Culture, and 93 is the, uh, the department, just as Paris is 7-5, Saint-Saint-Denis is 93. And there was a wonderful theater. I mean, they're still active, but they, their heyday was sort of the 80s, 90s, beginning of the 2000s, um, the MC 93. And, uh, and I was hired by this director uh, who liked to adapt novels to the stage. So I worked with this director, Nicolas Bigard, but we also, uh, part of the whole point of the MC 93 uh, was community outreach. So we did workshops in, uh, in high schools, junior high schools, um, theater, journalism, creative writing workshops um, in Bobigny and Bondy uh, mainly. And so I got to know a whole side of French life that a lot of my American friends in Paris have never seen. Um, and it was, it was a real eye opener. Um, so I did that for, for on and off for about eight or nine years before the funding dried up. Um, but working in the theater, <laughs> Um, it inspired me to try my hand at, uh, at writing theater. Um, and so I, I wrote a play about uh, Richard Wright, James Baldwin. These are two authors I already mentioned and how it influenced me. Um, um, their relationship in Paris in the, 19, in the 1940s. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I... Well, actually, before I go into writing Baldwin, I, I, I should talk more about my getting published in France because uh, my books were published totally out of sequence here. Um, so the first book of mine that was published in French was actually the fourth book uh, that was published in the United States. And I think it was my third or fourth book published in France, which was actually my first book in the States. So Bourgeois <laughs> Blues, even though Bourgeois Blues uh, had a French word in the title, my, my, my French publisher didn't like the title. So, uh, <laughs> so they called it uh, Confession d'un fils modèle, Confessions of a Model Son, which is an ironic title because a model son wouldn't write that book. But, um, <laughs> But it was, a, it was a long time before 
I felt ready to write about Paris, and 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 to this day, it, it it really irritates me when American journalists arrive in Paris, and after a week, they're experts on all things French. You know, I think it really takes a while to get to know a culture. So I'd been living here for seven years before I felt ready to write about Paris. And when I did write about Paris, I wanted to write about the Paris that I knew, which is the 18th arrondissement. And, um, and if you're familiar with Paris, you, you know it's divided into 20 arrondissements. And as arrondissements go, the 18th is gigantic. It's, it's in the north of Paris, and it's best known for the neighborhood of Montmartre, which a lot of people know from the movie Amélie. Uh, there's the big white church, the Basilica Sacré-Cœur, <laughs> at the top of the Butte Montmartre. Uh, historically, it's a neighborhood that attracted artists and bohemians. Uh, Renoir lived there, Picasso when he first arrived in Paris, uh, Van Gogh, most famously Toulouse-Lautrec, lived up there. Um, you have, in the 18th arrondissement, you have the border of Pigalle, the red light district, and the Moulin Rouge. Uh, you have this very wealthy area, the, the Avenue Junot, which is full of these mansions and villas. Uh, you have Barbès, the biggest African Arab neighborhood in Paris. You have the area near the Mairie of the 18th, um, near Metro Jules Joffrin. That's where my wife and I live. I think probably that is ethnically and economically the most mixed neighborhood in Paris, which is uh, what I love about it. Uh, and so when I finally wrote about Paris, I wanted to write about the 18th arrondissement. So I wrote one of my thrillerish books. Um, and when I say thrillerish, I mean, I don't have a cop or a private detective as a protagonist. I don't have uh, a recurring protagonist. I don't write series. But I like suspense. I like intrigue. I like a story that moves. And so my first book set in Paris is Rendezvous 18th. Now, this is the American version. And uh, this came out in 2003. My, uh, my American publisher said, well, if you're writing a book about Paris, you have to have the Eiffel Tower on the cover. I was just, <laughs> just going to ask. The Eiffel Tower has I nothing mean, really? to do with the 18th arrondissement. Yeah. So, uh, so when the book came out in <laughs> French, the French publisher had a sort of a more appropriate cover for the 18th, you know. Uh, uh, Montmartre was full of like stairs and alleyways and weird passages and so... And at least and so, the Moulin Rouge, I could understand. The, the, uh, the no, no, this, pic this picture was taken in the 7th. No, yeah. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so America, Very France, um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's my, my, my first Paris book. I'll pass those around. Um, so, uh, let me go back to where I digressed from, uh, which is uh, the early, the 2011, 2012, um, I was working in Bobigny at this theater and decided to take an idea that I'd had for a novel and write it as a play because I was enjoying working in theater so much. So I had this idea for a novel about the relationship between Richard Wright and James Baldwin. I had known that they had a very contentious relationship, that, uh, that um, uh, Wright had been a mentor to Baldwin, felt that Baldwin had betrayed him, turned on him, and it led to this feud that went on for years. Um, and I also knew, I probably learned in college, that Wright and Baldwin had had this epic argument at the Café Les Deux Magots in May of 1953, they had this knockdown, drag out argument about, about uh, friendship, loyalty, betrayal, race, art, writing. It, they just tackled everything in a very contentious way. Only when I came to Paris did I learn that during that whole epic conversation, Chester Himes had been sitting at the table the whole time. <laughs> Now, Chester Himes is a writer I did not discover until I got to Paris. Um, I remember as a kid, uh, my parents talking about uh, Cotton Comes to Harlem, uh, the novel and, and the movie, but I never heard them mention the author. Only when I came to Paris did I have all these people telling me about Chester Himes, and, and I learned that Chester Himes was a highly regarded author in France. Um, I'd never read him. Um, so I finally read uh, his first novel. If you, if you want an introduction to Himes, uh, I would recommend If He Hollers, Let Him Go. It was published in 1945. It's like a book from the 60s. I mean, the, 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 the guy was 20 years ahead of his time. Um, 
and there's a there's a there's a tone and a point of view that is so extraordinary um, and so unusual for that era of writing. Um, I was just blown away when I when I finally read Chester Himes. Um, Himes, after writing a number of novels that were categorized as protest fiction, turned at the suggestion of his French translator. He turned to the crime genre. Um, so, um, like Wright and Baldwin. Himes came to Paris in 1953. Um, he was here on and off for many years, uh, finally settled in Spain, died in Spain in the 1980s. But he was part of the Paris community when he felt like it um, in the 50s and 60s. And it was at the suggestion of his editor, his translator, Marcel Duhamel, that he write a crime novel, because Marcel Duhamel had also founded the Série Noire, which was the first crime fiction imprint in France at Gallimard. So Duhamel said to, to Himes, you know, whose books weren't selling particularly well, he said, you know, you've got the perfect style for a crime novel, for a crime fiction. You know, you, you know you, you're snappy, you're direct, you, your stories move. Try your hand at, at a crime novel. So Himes went on to write a series of novels known as The Harlem Cycle, um, and they're focused on two black police detectives in Harlem, Gravedigger Jones and Coffin Ed Johnson. <laughs> there are nine novels in the cycle. The best known are A Rage in Harlem and Cotton Comes to Harlem, uh, but they're all great. I'm, I've, I've read all but the last one. I'm saving <laughs> number nine. Uh, um, but the, the, the novels are amazing. The, um, I, mean, I mean, they're funny. It's social satire. They're gripping thrillers. And his depiction of Harlem, Harlem is just this violent phantasmagoria and, and, and Digger and Coffin Ed, these two <laughs> cops, they've got to be badder than all the bad people in Harlem to, to, to protect the, 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 the good, hardworking the people of the community. Digger and Coffin Ed have to be bad, bad, the baddest of the bad. Um, and so the, the books are just uh, yeah, really interesting and entertaining. So I was loving these books and discovered that in May of 1953, during this epic argument between Wright and Baldwin, Himes was sitting at the table the whole time. All three men wrote about what happened that night. Each one gave a very different version of events. <laughs> and that's why the, oh, this is, this is a story. So, uh, so, so I had thought I was gonna do this as a novel and then decided to write it as a play because I was working in, in Bobigny. Eventually, I adapted it for the radio, and, uh, and I have to often explain, uh, radio drama in, in France and England never entirely went away. You know, uh, in America, television killed radio drama in about 1955. Um, in France and England, there's still radio drama. I have friends who've written radio dramas for the BBC in England, and here in France on, um, on the station France Culture, um, every weekday night, Monday through Friday at 8.30, there is what's called the feuilleton, uh, the sort of ongoing series. And usually uh, the series are five or ten episodes, sometimes 15 episodes. And it's everything from original dramas to adaptations of Balzac or, or Dickens. There's also a theater show, Sunday nights, called uh, Theater and Company. And so Brothers in Exile was adapted for the Sunday night theater show. And it was amazing. This is like real, old, like Radio Days style production, you know. Radio France has these amazing studios. There's this one studio that the room is just a room of cobblestones. So you can get the sound effects of people walking on cobblestones. You don't have to go outside. The cobblestones are there in the studio. They have the, 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 the sound effects people are known as the bruiteurs, bruiteurs. They, they, they make noise, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and we had just a fantastic cast. Uh, the three actors playing Wright, Baldwin, and Himes are all highly regarded uh, theater and film actors here. Um, and I just loved the experience. <laughs> and while I was working on that adaptation, I discovered that Radio France has the rights to play any song you can name. They have this infinite digital library and um, they must pay some gigantic fee. I, I, I imagine the BBC does the same. NPR in the States, they, they pay some giant fee somewhere to have the rights to play any song you can name. 
So that really intrigued me because just as Brothers in Exile was airing for the first time, um, or we we're going into production on it, um, I had another idea for a novel that I've been working on for a while. And this we can talk more when I open the floor to questions, but I'm, I, I'm a great believer in outlines. Um, I think an outline is really just the only way to organize your imagination and to make sure that ideas that waft through your brain don't disappear forever. So, so I'm big on outlines. So I had a pretty detailed outline for a, a novel that was set in the jazz world of Harlem uh, between 1936 and 1961. Um, when I found out that Radio France could play any song you could name, I thought, wow, what if I do this as a radio play? What if I wrote a series and had the jazz selections in the script? So I came up with a separate outline. So, so, so the work is called Viper's Dream. I often describe the two versions as non-identical twins, the, 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 the novel and the radio series. They, 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 they just stated and were born at the same time, but the resemblances are often more superficial than, uh, than profound. But I wrote um, uh, 10 episodes uh, for the Feuilleton, the, 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 the show that's on France Culture every night. Um, 10 episode radio drama, 25 minutes per episode. It was a huge production. We recorded this in, in 2018, um, 13 days of recording, 10 hour days, 50 people in the cast, 50 actors, 35 black actors. We had the cream of black theater and cinema and television working on this, working on this production. Um, it was so much fun. Um, and as I said, I could put musical selections in the script. So I could say, she walks into the room and we hear Duke Ellington's Prelude to a Kiss, 1957 recording with Johnny Hodges on saxophone. And my director would say, okay. And we did this. So there were a hundred songs in this 10 episode radio drama. Once I was done writing the script, I returned my attention to the outline for the novel. So uh, the radio drama aired for the first time in 2019. The novel was scheduled to come out in France in 2020, but of course it was delayed because of the, uh, the, the pandemic. So this novel, which I wrote in English, came out first in French, Viper's Dream. So this is the first version of the book that came out in France in September of 2021. That's a photo by Robert Kappa on the cover. So Robert Kappa, best known as a war photographer, um, in the 1930s, he went to Harlem and did these amazing portraits of, of people living there. Um, and so I've always felt this, 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 this guy, whoever he was, kind of represents my protagonist, uh, a, a, a gangster, uh, goes by the name of Clyde, Clyde the Viper Morton, uh, Viper is his nickname. So, so, um, so I always thought that sort of represented a, a, a Viper Morton. Um, I'll pass that around. Um, and at this point, it had been a long time since I'd published a book in America, you know, the, the, you know, the American publishing industry just kind of forgot about me. And, and I was very happy over here. You know, I was living in France. I spoke French. You know, my work was published in French. I didn't really, I wasn't really preoccupied with the American marketplace. But with this book, I thought, you know, it's, it's such an American story, such a black American story. I thought I really should try to get it published in English. Um, but knowing that, you know, there's probably a non-starter in America, it finally occurred to me that there are other countries in the world where people read and speak English, like, say, England. So I asked my French publisher, I, uh, my French editor, Jean Guillaume, and I said, uh, do you know anybody you know, who might be interested in this in England? And she said something to the effect of, I know just the bloke. And she recommended Ian Mills, um, uh, um, uh, uh, a terrific editor based in London. So I mentioned in France the Série Noire, the first great French crime imprint by Gallimard. Série Noire in the 1980s was eclipsed by Rivage Noir, a house founded by uh, Francois Guérif and his uh, number two was Jean Guillaume. So I'm published in France by Rivage Noir. Um, which is, you know, however you want to define it, literary crime fiction. Um, my straight novels and the memoir were published by Rivage, but my thrillerish books were published by 
Rivage Noir. Um, but this book, this this was really my 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 deepest dive in the genre. I, I, I really, with this book, wanted to write a hard-boiled noir in the style of Chester Himes, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, just for the fun of it. I just wanted to, to, to try and do that. Um, so the, the British publisher that uh, Zhang Guion recommended is Ian Mills, who has this house No Exit Press, also literary crime fiction. So this came out in England a year ago this week. Uh, did very well in the UK. And, and I was introduced to yet another reading culture. And, and one thing you don't think about consciously until you know, you're thrown into that world, there's something like nine or 10 national daily papers in England. You know, I mean, what's a national daily in America? Maybe the New York Times, Washington Post, you got nine or ten of them in, in, in England, and six or seven of them loved this book. <laughs> so, uh, so that was a great introduction to, uh, to England. I did a little tour in London and Bristol. I'm going to be giving a talk at Oxford in, in August. There's a, there's, a, there's a crime fiction festival where writers are invited to come and give a sort of quasi-academic lecture on their work. So that'll be in August. Um, and I knew... I guessed, and it turned out that I guessed right, that if I got a publisher in England, I'd get a publisher in America. Because it's just a question of market share. If, 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 if this book comes out in English only by a British publisher, the British publisher would have had the right to distribute the book in America. So I thought some American publisher is going to say, why should we let some Brit get the money that we could get selling this book in New York? Let's buy the rights. And that's exactly what happened. So a house called Crooked Lane Books, another literary crime house in America, bought the, the American rights to Viper's Dream. So it came out in England in April. It came out in the USA in September. Uh, I've got a nice review in the New York Times and some nice notices. But again, it's just a different culture from England. I mean, America, just, it's just a gigantic country. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's hard to break through to, uh, to a large readership. But the book has done well. Um, the French, the, the American publisher went a completely different direction with the jacket. So, so my British publisher, this is inspired by those old jazz albums from the 50s and 60s, uh, a Blue Note, Reprise, Prestige. Um, the Americans went a completely different direction. And, and, and as I said, um, this is a real deep dive into genre. And, 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 and when you embrace genre, you have to embrace archetypes not stereotypes but archetypes and that the femme fatale is an archetype of noir fiction and so this book has a femme fatale she's a jazz singer named Yolanda de Vray nicknamed Yo-Yo and uh, and I felt that that what they decided to do was find a character just as this the guy on this cover and on the French cover sort of represents uh, Clyde Morton. I felt that the image on this uh, American jacket represents uh, uh, Yolanda de Vray. So, um, so as I say, the book's been well received. Um, I'm currently working on another piece for the radio, um, a thriller about chess. And I'll probably turn that into a novel as well. And um, as Adrian mentioned the bio, I'm working on a, on a memoir about my life in Paris. That's a very long-term project, you know. Uh, Hemingway published Immovable Feast posthumously, so I might wait till <laughs> I'm dead to, to, to have that memoir <laughs> see the light of day. So um, I'm happy to take any questions you have about anything. Yes? So are you writing in French? I can write dialogue in French. Um, because dialogue's the ear. So, so when I worked in theater, um, I would sometimes, you know, working with actors and the director, come up with dialogue in French. Um, my radio plays, because I'm working from an outline, I'll r write a first draft, certainly in English, but as the play evolves, um, I work with my wife on the translation. So. Um, so, you know, I, I've, you know, some, I've, you know, I've said, you know, do you want translation credit? She, she doesn't want it because she doesn't feel it's really a translation. You know, when I, when I write a novel, I give the manuscript to my French house, they find a translator, and then I check the translation. 
with my play and my radio stuff, uh, my wife Dorley, uh, she and I, we really work together, you know. And so and so she knows my voice, you know, and uh, and she has a, a good ear. And so, uh, and so we worked together on the translations. I couldn't do it myself. I, 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 I could not, I couldn't write really beyond dialogue in French. I mean, I couldn't write a description of this room in French, you know. Um, that, would be, that would be a challenge, you know. But, but capturing the way people speak, that, that I can do, yeah. Yes? Do you have thoughts about writing longhand as opposed to computer? Yeah, so my first three books I wrote in longhand. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take this sweater off. Hang on, Willow. Are we are we still good with the mic? Yeah, just just hold on to it. Hang on, I'll clip this on the shirt. We're watching him undress. <laughs> 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 on, on camera, on camera. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um. <laughs> So I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the questions. The first question was, do I write in French? The second question I, I, I just received was, um, do I have thoughts on, on longhand versus writing on, the, writing on the computer? I wrote my first three books uh, in longhand. And, and it was really uh, a way to get away from journalistic writing. You know, that I'd spent six years at Time Magazine writing in Time style. I thought I need to have a different relationship to text. You know, I'm not writing on a weekly deadline. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm. I, I need to take my time, think through the sentences. And so my first three books I wrote in longhand and then transcribed onto the, onto the, um, onto the computer. Um, as I said, I do a lot of outlining. So I do my outlines in longhand. I I do outlines on big drawing pads, big white drawing pads. So I'll do the outline on drawing pads. I'll stick those pages on the wall and then sit in front of the computer and write mm. with the outline as, as my guide. So, so I do feel pen to paper, it's important for me. Um, and, and after that third book, I got to the point where, okay, I can just outline by longhand, but you know, I can, I can, I can write on the, directly onto the keyboard. Yes. So my question is about jazz. Mm -hmm. um, so I live very near um, uh, the Busy Sally. Mm -hmm. you, sure. So this is my favorite spot. And you know, of course, there are jazz spots all along the way. Uh, so I wonder if you are very involved in the local jazz scene and if you can tell us what your favorite spot is. Yeah, yeah. The question is, am I am I involved in the in the local jazz scene, and and what's a favorite spot? I like the sunset and the sunside, actually. Yeah, uh, um, I, I I find that they're just reliable. You know, if if you just want to go see a night of jazz in Paris, you know, something good is probably going to be on there. Um, you know, I've uh, the Duc de Lombard has gotten very expensive over the years. There was a. Gr all have a jazz like a jam night, so it can be for free. All right, all right, yeah, yeah. Duke de Lombard, they, they, just, they just got too expensive. Um, there was a great club called the Hot Brass. I don't know if they're still around. It used to be in, in, in Parc de la Villette. Kind of yeah, 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 yeah. No, I actually, I, I don't get around much anymore. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't go to jazz clubs as much as I used to. Um, did a very interesting father, did he give you your interest in jazz? Oh, let me get back to that. Yeah, 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 hang on. Uh, yeah, because that's a, that's a good question. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think you know going along the, the, the those clubs on the Duc de Lombard. There's an interesting place up in, in Montmartre, um, on the, um, oh my God, what's it called? It'll come back to me on the Rue Benoit, uh, the, the jazz cellar type place. Um, oh, it's gonna come back to me. The, the name of this place. Then there's the Café Blomé, which is excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's not just jazz. Café Blomé, which was. Um, years ago where Josephine Baker played oh, back yeah. when it was known as you know you can't say this word so much anymore but it was the Café Negre and uh, the Le Bal Negre mm -hmm. and it's now the Bal Blomé and it's on Rue Blomé okay. and uh, and it's a terrific they've redone that whole space that's a terrific space actually thank you um, and the, other, the name of the road that you thought the other one was on the Babilo it's not the Babilo the Babilo yes yeah, the Babilo. Merci the Babilo that, 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 yeah, that, that, that's in Montmartre yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how did we go to the subject of jazz? Because, because <laughs> his book is my, my book is on jazz. Is yeah. on, uh, 
Harlem jazz. Scene. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there and there is. A, things I wanted to ask you. And before. there there is a, a, a half of a chapter takes place in Paris. Okay. Uh, my 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 femme fatale jazz diva uh, goes to Paris at one point in the book. <laughs> and it, 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 it's in 1960. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. The book is set between uh, 1936 and 1961, and in a in a in a chapter set in 1960, uh, Yolanda is in Paris. So I uh, so I write about the Paris jazz scene, Saint Germain, Dupré, and uh, and all that back in that era. The other question was, did my father inspire my interest in jazz? Actually, my whole family inspired my interest in jazz. So um, I have to preface it by saying. I don't think anyone in my family, in my entire extended family, played an instrument. <laughs> but everybody loved music. And so, you know, the radio was on, the record player was on. I was born in 1961, so the first 10 years of my life coincided with, you know, one of the most exciting decades for popular music in the 20th century. And, um, and we loved all kinds of music, you know, uh, rock and roll, rhythm and blues, Motown, Stax, but jazz was was special for me, and uh, and I, I could I could just hear that it was different from other types of music. Uh, my mother uh, especially liked uh, Count Basie, um, but she also liked you know Dionne Warwick singing Burt Bacharach songs, you know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I had an uncle, my uncle James, who had a fantastic jazz collection. And, and, and when, when you think about the more esoteric jazz, Monk, Coltrane, Miles Davis, uh, I probably learned the most from my uncle James, who, who had this terrific collection. Um, when I started taking my own writing seriously in college, or trying to take it seriously, when I was taking creative writing classes, um, I would write short stories while listening to jazz. And that's a habit that's continued. I don't just listen to jazz, but I'm always listening to music when I write. I, I, I find that's, that's, that's like a very good way to get me into that kind of trance-like state you need to be in when you're writing. So, but, uh, you know, but I've got pretty broad tastes, you know, jazz, classical. I like the, the great movie soundtrack composers, uh, uh, Ennio Morricone, uh, Nino Rota. Um, I like Philip Glass, you know, so I, I listen to music uh, while I write. But I do think it was, I think it was probably inevitable that I would write about jazz someday because the music was so interesting to me. Um, um, and I just needed to find the right time, to find the right set of characters. And, uh, and, and finally, when I sat down to, to write this story, I thought, oh, this is, this is, uh, this is the moment. And, um, and I also liked writing about that era in jazz because um, the book begins when when my protagonist um, Clyde Morton he leaves Alabama and goes to New York goes to Harlem in hopes of becoming a musician so when he arrives in 1936 the the the, the popular jazz of the day was swing big bands you know the orchestras of, of, of Duke Ellington Count Basie that was jazz um, then the, the book, the novel, tracks the evolution over the, the next 25 years. And so in the 1940s, you have the bebop revolution. You have Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk. And jazz transitions from being music you could dance to to music you had to listen to. Then in the 50s, you get even further exploration with Miles Davis and John Coltrane and cool jazz. And so I track that whole evolution right up until, you know, the explosion of rock and roll. So, so towards the end of the book, you know, the, the, the jazz club is the, uh, a jazz club that I, that I write about a lot is starting to turn into a rock and roll club. You know, Little Richard's performing there. You know, so, so I write about that whole evolution over those, those 25 years, just because I find it such a, such a rich period in, in, in the history of jazz. Yes? Do you have any thoughts on Beyonce going uh, country? <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. I... I think I think I just really stopped following popular music sometime in the 1990s. I don't really know Beyonce's work. I don't know Taylor Swift's work. I really I'm I, I'm 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 frozen in the 20th I'm with century. You. No, but it's not it's not out of distaste. It's not out of any it's not out of any aversion. 
I, I just find that, that, that my tastes are kind of frozen in the 20th century. I continue to follow Prince up until he died. Um, but really, I, 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 I don't know many Beyonce songs or Taylor Swift songs or anybody who's popular now. I, I, I don't really know what, what, what they're doing. So. I just heard Beyonce's rendition of Jolene, mm -hmm. and I got really upset. <laughs> All right. I just said, I'm sorry. That is not Dolly Parton. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have to say, I have no... Dolly Parton likes it. Yeah. Well, I... Maybe. Anyway. I, 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 have, no, I have no opinion on the matter because I don't, I don't know the work. So. She's not begging, that's for sure. I'm begging. I have yes. A, Do you always stick to your outline or have you ever found yourself going away from the outline? No, that's yeah, a good question. Yeah, yeah. So... Outlines. Uh, it, it's, 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 it, it, it's one of these tricks of the trade that pe people don't often talk about, you know. And, um, and um, I find uh, outlines are useful in so many ways. So I already said the first thing is you just get an idea and it goes through your brain and you're going to lose it. I mean, if, if, if I get an idea for something that happens in the middle of a story I'm imagining, you know, in the chronological middle of the story, and I don't get it down somehow, and I'm writing the book chronologically, I'll forget, you know, what, what that idea was. And a week later, it's like, oh my God, what was that idea I had for this part of the book? So I'm a big believer in outlines. For me, you know, when you embark on a book, you know, you're, you're embarking on something that doesn't exist, you know? I mean, it exists only in your brain. And so, you know, unlike, say, reportage, you know, if you're going to cover a story somewhere, you're, you're interviewing somebody, you're watching a scene, when you're writing fiction, it's, it's, it's completely coming outside, it's out of you. So um, I think of an outline as like a map for an unknown continent. You know, it's, it's, it, I imagine that I'm in my little ship and I, I sail up to this continent and, and I don't know what's out there, but I've got this map, you know, and, and oh, I think uh, 100 miles in, uh, there's a mountain range, you know. So I start writing and then my story evolves and I find, oh, it's not a mountain range, it's a river. Okay, so I adapt accordingly, you know. I'll keep writing and I think, oh, chapter five, I'm gonna have the equivalent of a, of a desert, you know. But the story evolves and I realize, oh no, it's not a desert, it's a rainforest, you know. And so I'm, the outline changes as I write the story. But I have that map, I have that plan. The other useful thing about an outline is not having the terror of the blank page or the blank screen every day. So I mentioned um, the studio apartment that I rented when I uh, was first here on Rue de Montseny. After I met Dorley, the woman I would go on to marry, I kept that apartment as my office. So Dorley and I live down near the Mairie of the 18th. And when I go to work, I climb the Butte Montmartre and I go to my studio apartment. And that's my office. Uh, and if I'm in that place, I'm writing. And uh, Joseph Heller, who wrote Catch-22, mm -hmm. had a great line about writing. He said, you know, writing is like a controlled daydream that, you know, <laughs> you're sort of sitting by yourself and you're letting your mind wander, you're letting your imagination roam where it will, um, but you've got to do something to kind to hold on to that daydream, you know, and, and that's where um, outlines come in. Um, one of my residencies in, in the banlieue, um, a, a wonderful woman started a bookshop in Bobigny. It didn't last, but the, book, but the bookshop existed for about five years. And um, back in, oh, I forget when, you know, 10 years ago, less, um, I was doing a creative writing workshop at the Mediatek connected to the MC Catavantres, the theater in, in Bobigny. So I did this workshop with adults um, Saturday afternoons and um, and to support the bookshop every month I would invite a, a French usually a noir writer uh, crime fiction um, I would invite them to come and talk about one of their books so I'd assign that one book to the class to my workshop uh, the book would be on display in the bookshop for people to buy 
And then the writer would come and I would interview the writer about their book. And at the end of, you know, or towards the end of the talk, I would always talk about practical things, working methods. And I always asked, do you work from an outline? 10 writers over 10 months, every single writer, including Nancy Houston, <laughs> worked from an outline. I was surprised. I, I didn't think it would be that uh, all-encompassing. But, um, but I think that's, that's, that's a sign of, 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 of how useful it can be just to, to organize your imagination and just keep the momentum going day by day. You know, um, with an outline, you don't walk in not knowing what you're going to do that day. You've got something that you can work on. And to maintain the continuity of the story, so you don't say something that is completely false. And to maintain the continuity of the story, yes. And, 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 I, and I met a British writer recently. Um, he had, um, anyway, I, I, I read one of his novels, a crime novel. The first hundred pages were great. And then after that, the story just fell apart. And, and I met him, and somehow the subject of outlines came up, and I could tell he didn't know what I was talking about. And, 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 and I think part of what happened with his book is he just lost a sense of where the story was going, and it just starts to meander, and for the next 300 pages, it just wasn't that interesting. So yeah, continuity, absolutely. Yes? I have a question about your publishing journey. Um, I'm a writer, both for work and for fun, and mm -hmm. I think you're very inspiring, and uh, I would like to publish a novel someday, and I'm currently looking for an agent and getting into the publishing scheme, and I'm wondering, <laughs> do you recommend looking for an agent in America, looking for publishers in America, looking in the UK? I'm American, so I don't know. What's your advice on that? Yeah, well, you know, certainly you want to start with an agent, I, I think. And, and, and I know, you know, there are different ways to do it these days. Um, you know, self-publishing wasn't a thing when I started out. Um, but now lots of people have had a lot of success through that. Um, and getting an agent back when I was starting out was like a, almost a word of mouth thing. You know, you had to have somebody tell you. Now there are whole listings, you know. So if you're, if you're writing young adult fiction, you can find young adult agents. You know, if you're writing thrillers, you can find agents for that. Um, from what I understand from people who are starting out, that's the key, uh, finding an agent. Um, and it depends on where you want to get published. So certainly, yeah, if you're American, you're writing in English, I think you want to go with an American agent. Um, the French don't like agents. Uh, my editor, Francois Guérif, really doesn't like agents. And, uh, and, and, and it's funny, there's a, there's a, there's a different rapport with, uh, with writers and editors in this country. Um, they actually read unsolicited manuscripts in France. You know, which they don't do in America. They've never done. You know, in America, if a, if a, if a manuscript doesn't come through an agent, nobody's going to read it. Um, in France, publishers will get unsolicited manuscripts and actually read them. And, and uh, Francois Guérif, you know, he's old school, you know, with his French writers, they don't operate through agents. But he publishes a lot of American writers, and we've got agents. And so when my books are published in France, my French publisher is buying the French rights to a book written by an American. So my French publisher always has to deal with my agency. Um, I mentioned I've had the same agent since 1988. I mean, we were both in our 20s when we met. Now she's a big shot at CAA. So, so the Creative Artists Agency, it was, ICM got swallowed up by CAA, but in any event, my agent has stuck by me all these years. Uh, she's got a lot more clients to make much more money for her than I do. But, um, but it's, 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 it's protection, really, you know? Really, having an agency, you know, I don't know how to negotiate a contract. You know, but uh, my agency does, and um, and and they make sure that you know you get what's coming to you, and I think um, I think I'm I think you know French editors are you know honest and and deal in a straightforward way with their writers, but generally I I just think it's better to have an agent, so I would start there. And now, yeah, there are listings on the internet. I think uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. Do you think the French don't trust the agents? 
I think it's just uh, again, it's just it, it's, it's it's more of a cultural thing, you mm -hmm. know. It's sort of like, well, you know, writing is an art, and we're 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 ah, we're interested in this. Yeah, you know, it's they sort commercial. of they sort of don't want to. Editors don't mm -hmm. want to stress the transactional aspect of it mm -hmm. with their writers, but it is a transaction, and mm -hmm. and there are contracts, <laughs> and and uh, and, uh, and and so I think I think it's it's. It's it's evolving. It's 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 changing. I think I think there are more there are more and more French writers who are probably uh, represented by agents, um, but it's it's nothing like what exists in America or, or or the UK, from what I can tell. It's different different attitude towards business. You know, the French don't like to talk about money, right? So right. Yeah. So you know. yeah. 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 You must not need any. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've had I've had two uh, books option for for movies, a Rendezvous Eighteenth, and uh, and the Last Integrationist. Nothing ever happened with either one. Um, you know, hope springs eternal. Um, <laughs> now, Rendezvous Eighteenth, there was a really interesting director and, and uh, screenwriter and director, um, and I realized working with him, or seeing what he did with the script, I, I could never adapt one of my own novels. So um, screenwriting is, you know, all novels are kind of interested in screenwriting. But, um, but Rendezvous 18th, um, this guy, he, uh, he was working out in Hollywood back in 2003, okay? So he came to Paris. I showed him all the locations in the book. He went back to Hollywood, you know, six months later, I got the script and I really liked it. But he did stuff that I would never have thought to do. I think there's a flashback that opens chapter five he started the screenplay with that and there are whole scenes you know a scene that's you know four pages in the novel he cuts down to four lines of dialogue i don't think i could do that to my own book you know <laughs> but uh but he did a great job and uh and for years he kept re-upping you know and uh, and was meeting with actors and just nothing ever happened and and but i, but I began to understand the um the expression green lighting because, because I, I realized, you know, in publishing, an editor says yes or they say no. You know, I think in, in, in my experience with theater sometimes, and especially in the movies, nobody says yes and nobody says no. You spend your life in front of a yellow light, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and suddenly the light turns green and you, you, you jump at it. And so, uh, and so, but you know, I have, you know, I have friends, of, uh, uh, a friend of mine in, in the States is the writer uh, Percival Everett. Have you heard about the film yes, American yes, Fiction? Yes. Yeah. So that's based on a novel called Erasure. That novel came out in 2001. I, it's brilliant. Percival is a brilliant writer, but, it's the, but it's, it's the last book you would have thought would be adapted to the cinema. You know, and the guy, uh, Cord Jefferson, did a terrific job adapting it. So the film is called American Fiction, but it's based on a 24-year-old novel, 23-year-old novel called Erasure by, uh, by Percival Everett. So I thought, wow, well, if, if a Percival Everett novel can get turned into a popular movie, maybe I've got a chance. So. <laughs> I, I, I'd be game, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, well, what about a series, uh, the, was the question. Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Viper's Dream, the, the blueprint's right there. I mean, I, I, I think if you wanted to do it, not as a film, but as a, as a, as a Netflix series, it, it's laid out right there for you. So, um, so you know, I, I, you know at, at this point in my life, you hear things, I know people, I know screenwriters out in Hollywood, I know producers. You know, I know the book's being, you know, talked about, but until, you know, you sign a contract, nothing is real. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, um, you, you teach creative writing at Sciences Po. Mm. Um, I think, you know, it's not in French culture to be too creative when you're in school. So how is it at Sciences Po? <laughs> yeah, the question was about teaching creative writing, uh, specifically at Sciences Po. Yeah, well, the whole thing about creative writing, the French didn't even understand what that was, you know? Um, um, and it's funny because, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, in America, I think probably Flannery O'Connor is the writer who put creative writing workshops on the map. Uh, she went to Iowa back in the 40s, 50s. 
I took creative writing classes going back to high school. And, and there's a whole methodology that's been developed in America that, uh, that, that doesn't exist in Europe. Um, and in my, I think it was my first year here, I, I, I met someone who was teaching a, um, um, culture courses at, uh, at Sciences Po. And, um, and she connected me with someone at the, at the school and I, and I walked in with this idea and I told this administrator, yes, you know, you know creative writing is an established thing. I've taught it in the States. And she said, so, she looked at me like I was crazy. You know, she's like, so the <laughs> students, they, they make up little stories? <laughs> 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 and you talk about them? And I was like, yeah, creative writing. And she's like, okay, really. She, she talked to me like I was a crazy person. And yeah, I got this very you know, insulting rejection letter. 25 years later, Sion's Poe approached me about a creative writing class. Wow. It had become a thing, and, and, and it happened slowly. And so the first creative writing course I taught in France was um, probably at Ecole Polytechnique, um, because it was mainly, but it was in the language department. So they would have courses taught in different languages to help the students develop their language skills. So, so, I, uh, so, so I, taught, um, I taught in English, but at Ecole Polytechnique. Then I started the workshop in French in Beaubigny and started doing workshops in high schools in the banlieue in French. And I could see there was more of a sense in French culture that this was something useful. And so finally in 2018, Sciences Po started a creative writing department. And, uh, and a big part. And um, it was thanks to my friend uh, Papin Diai, who taught at Sciences Po before he made the mistake of going into politics. Um, uh, uh, Pap recommended me for, uh, for, for, for the job at Sciences Po. So I teach an English language creative writing workshop at Sciences Po, but they have workshops taught in French. Um, and um, and uh, my students come from all over the world. They're, they're absolutely brilliant. And, and I don't know, I do find sometimes when I talk to my French colleagues, they're a little bit at sea about how to, how to run a workshop. You know, again, they don't have the methodology that, 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 we, that we have in the States. And, and, and one thing I try to do in teaching creative writing, I mean, I, I do think writing is fundamentally mysterious. Where stories come from, where characters come from, what they do. These are really hard things to understand. But I try to demystify the process and to try and make things concrete. So that's why I go back to outlines. You know, that's a way of, 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 of turning something mysterious and fleeting into something solid that you can work with. So my course is called Architecture of Storytelling. And we look at things like structure, developing a plot, conveying information through dialogue. These are things that, I mean, you can study, uh, uh, you know, a short story by James Baldwin or uh, uh, Shirley Jackson and pick it apart. And that's what we'll do in my class. We'll just go through a story by a great American writer, do a kind of autopsy on the story, <laughs> you know, <laughs> see how was this put together? How did they do it? And I'll give them exercises inspired by that. So my approach is always about demystifying what can be demystified while appreciating that the process is fundamentally mysterious. I think sometimes the French would just got blocked on that mysterious thing. Oh, you can't teach writing, it's impossible. You, you can't teach someone how to become a writer, but you can teach someone, you know, these practical things, you know, the, the, the building blocks of, 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 of creating a story. That I know can be taught because uh, I've been doing but, it for a long time can, now. But you can teach how to be creative. You can learn how to be creative as well. They just don't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The question is, can you learn how to be creative? Uh, I, yeah, I suppose you can. But again, anybody who's taking my workshop is already interested in writing. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so what I try to do is just give people practical notions about how to go about getting what's in their head on the page. You, you do also have to get around the cultural thing of students. I work for Georgia Tech in a city called Metz. Mm -hmm. and they have a campus there. Sure. And our French master students have the hardest time engaging with the professor. They're just accustomed, at least in my experience and our mm -hmm. experience, to simply sitting there, uh, 
absorb the information and go study on their own. So getting them to engage is already a challenge. I suppose that's part of what you were Ab dealing with. Absolutely. And, and, and so the question is about dealing with French students and their reluctance to engage. Happily at Sciences Po, it's very international. Mm -hmm. and, and I didn't know until I started teaching there in 2019, you can get a degree at Sciences Po. You can get a master's degree without speaking French. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are all these courses mm -hmm. that are offered in English and I have students from all over the world. But yeah, but when I was at Polytechnique or when I was, you know, teaching adults or when we would go to these workshops in the banlieue, um, there is this French thing where the teacher is, you know, this authoritarian who lays down the law and you just write everything out mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, regurgitate what is, what is said. And, and, I, and it's funny because, I mean, I've seen this from middle schools in the banlieue to Ecole Polytechnique, which is like the MIT of France, you know. French students are just terrified of talking. And, and they're terrified. They're frightened of giving the wrong answer. Exactly. That's right. And 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 and, and the first the first time I was teaching at uh, the first time I was teaching at Polytechnique. Does anyone here know Almeida Speaks by any chance? Almeida Speaks. She's a, a, a pianist, singer. She she performed in the bar at the Ritz for years, and she had been teaching in the culture department, language and culture department at, at Polytechnique, a uh, course on African American music and culture. And she had to go and teach at Middlebury for a semester. So she asked me to fill in for her. And I was like, oh, you know, I don't know if I can do this. She's like, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. So the, the, the first day of class, you know, I've got the Polytechnician there, super brilliant French kids. And I was like, okay, so Louis Armstrong, uh, what instrument did Louis Armstrong play? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> like, like, come on, people, you know this, you know? And so one guy goes, the trumpet? Like, yes, the trumpet. Of course, he played the trumpet. You know, and, and I, they're terrified of giving the wrong answer. He, he thought it was a trick question. You know, uh, so once you can get past that, you know, uh, I found it could be really enriching. Once you can like get past that fear, and and you know, and I would do events and you know uh, workshops in the value, and there'd always be the their normal teacher present. You know, when I was doing my thing, and and sometimes the teacher would say, you know. Uh, a student asked me a question. She would say, that's an impertinent question. I said, no, it's fine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not impertinent at all. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take the question. And so, yeah, just getting French kids to open up is hard. And at, and at Sciences Po, you know, if I have, you know, on a typical semester, I'll have, you know, 20 students and, you know, five of them will be French. They're always the quietest students in class. They're always the quietest. I mean, I, I can get them to open up and, and engage, but, but usually those five French kids will be the quietest kids in the And class. I'll bet they love you. Because I get good evaluations. Because they've never had that experience yeah. before. It's like a sense of freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and writing, mm -hmm. creative writing is about freedom, you know? But isn't yeah. it fascinating that with all the art and culture that's here in France, that they teach appreciation, but they don't actually teach how to create it? Yeah, yeah, they, 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 yeah, and, and, and I do think that comes from a kind of exalted vision of what the artist is. And so just as they appreciate writing, they're also intimidated by the idea of writing. So, you know, it's... Uh, it's, it's true it's, for it's, art and music, uh, though, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not offered in the schools. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And, and there is a kind of narrowness to thinking about things, too. So, you know, in, in, in America or in England, you know, if you're an actor, you can also be a singer and you can do musical comedy and Shakespeare. That doesn't work in France. No, it's either you do musical comedy or you do Shakespeare or Moliere, you know, you don't uh, mix things. You stay in your lane, you know, uh, but I think, uh, I think, uh, you know, it's getting better. It's getting better. Think it's changing? I think it's changing. Becoming, I, I, I've, becoming I've seen a little it. more global? I've seen, I've seen it changing. I've seen it change. In the 30 years I've, I've been here, I've seen mm -hmm. it change. Yeah, absolutely. Do you yeah. think there's kind of an imprinting in primary schools and the, and the style of, of education that oh. kind of creates this and becomes... Yeah, yeah, that's where it starts. Yeah, so, so the question is, um, is this sort of reticence something that is, 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 is drilled into kids in school? Absolutely, and, and I think I know where it came from. Dictation. Because my, Dictation. Well, 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 no, well, well no, it's, it's, it's beyond that even. My, my parents, one of, the, one of the many reasons they didn't have a great marriage, my, 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 <laughs> my mother was a devout Catholic and my father was an atheist. 
So oh my, my first five years of school, I went to a Catholic school. And then at my father's insistence, my brother and I switched to Fieldston, this very progressive school. Um, and to me, that was sort of like being let out of an intellectual cage. And, and I see, you know, in the Catholic school tradition, you know, the nuns, you know, they tell you, write this, do this, do this, you know, you, you know, you, you know, raise your hand when you talk, you know, you can't, uh, you know, you, you, it's, it's very rigid. I think French education sort of comes out of that Catholic tradition. So Friday. even though Friday. France is totally secular and the schools I taught were, you know, strictly secular, you know, there was, you know, no talk about religion, but the style of the teachers reminded me of Catholic school. Yeah. Um, and I think it comes from that. I think it comes from the Catholic tradition of, of sort of doctrinaire, authoritarian uh, 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 style. And, uh, and when I switched to Fieldston, it was just totally different and, and, and very liberating. <laughs> that could be very true. Really, really good point, actually. Really good point. Mm -hmm. Yes, my daughter went through the French educational system. <laughs> I can attest to it. Uh huh. Yeah. It's stifling, to say the least. Mm -hmm. I think um, you can maybe repeat after us. I have four grandchildren who are in French schools, and they, if they're not getting the creative side in school, they're getting it in associations. Mm. You know, one of my little granddaughters is acting, and they're they're painting. And the schools, unfortunately, don't have the money now to do music and art. But, the but way they, they don't in the states either in public schools. But they know? have the conservatories. Yeah. It's a somewhat they have elitist system. Yes. Yeah. yeah. To be, I mean, I well, think not we all necessarily. Know that. No. If you mm -hmm. live in the suburbs, you can go to a conservatoire uh, on a Wednesday afternoon. But, and, but the and options also are the limited. conservatoire. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Fontenay sous Bois next to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. The conservatoire yeah. for music and dance. Their objective is to create professionals. So, if your kid does not want to do the concours, just wants to learn how to play the violin and, and be happy playing the violin, she will be rejected from the uh, conservatoire. I know this from experience. Uh, the first year, my daughter, you know, she was told she had to prepare the concours. She did it. And the second year, she went to her teacher. She said, look, I like playing the violin. I do not want to do this concours business. And he said, out. And okay, I think there's a difference between conservatoire and école de musique. I have Definite difference. The my, my children books. went to école de musique. Yeah. I have a professional, uh, my, yeah. my, my eldest son is a professional musician. Yeah. He learned to play the guitar at the école de musique in our little suburb out in the, you know. So I, I, you know, I think France is changing. It has a lot to offer, yes, yes. but um, there are still certain sectors at the Conservatoire, etc. But I see my little granddaughters acting. I mean, they put on these performances. That my other little granddaughter plays is a ballerina. I mean, they, they do a lot out of the school. Mm, but they, but you have to do it out of the school. school yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Any other questions? Yeah. Anything you want to say before we uh, uh, adjourn? No, I can't think of anything in particular. It's been a great session. Thanks, Thanks everybody. I really enjoyed <laughs> talking with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for a fantastic talk. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome to hang out. You're welcome to don't forget to pay on your we way didn't out. Get <laughs> you never got <laughs> served. <laughs> I was, I was trying to signal to you. Nobody ever did I'm so that. sorry. We, if, you ha if you didn't notice, Angelique is no longer here, and we have a new server. So maybe that's what uh, happened. He didn't come back up. that doesn't exist anymore. It's called... Oh, yeah, please. Oh, well, hey, hang on one sec. That got subsumed 